All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Friday, everybody. I hope all of you guys had an incredible week so far. We are live on AMP, so if you're watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast feed, don't forget that AMP is the very first place that you guys can get these shows. We're continuing our power rankings today with number 17, the Atlanta Hawks. I've got a full season preview of the Hawks for you guys, and then I've got three mailbag questions for the end of the show as well. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to the Volumes YouTube channel. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT. Don't forget about our podcast feed under Hoops tonight. And I need mailbag questions. Drop those in the YouTube comments. And last but not least, before we get started, the start of pro basketball is still about a month away or so, but there's no shortage of events to attend in the meantime. Obviously, your favorite baseball teams are out playing. We also have a, a lot of musicians touring the country and comedians touring the country, but also the return of pro and college football. And so lots of stuff to go see. And the best way to get tickets to any of these events is on Game Time, the fastest growing ticketing app in the United States. For amazing last minute deals on tickets to see your favorite football or baseball team or your favorite musician, singer, or comedian, Game Time has your tickets. Again, it's not just sports. There are several huge concerts and comedy shows still on tour. Download the Game Time app and redeem code HOOPS for $20 off your first purchase. Again, download the Game Time app and enter code HOOPS. That's H O O P S for $20 off. No matter where you live, get out and have some fun this week. Download the Game Time app. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, let's talk some basketball. So we're going to start with an off season recap for the Atlanta Hawks. They lost John Collins, traded him to the Utah Jazz, and they also lost Aaron Holiday. They added in the draft Kobe Bufkin, <clears throat> combo lefty, like kind of like shifty guard out of Michigan. Good spot-up player. He's up over a point per possession, 55% effective field goal percentage on catch-and-shoot jump shots. He also was 68th percentile in pick-and-roll. He's a good pick-and-roll playmaker, in large part because he was one of the best finishing guards at the rim in the country last year. He shot 72% at the rim, according to Synergy. That's outrageous. Over 60% is good for a guard. Just has all of the craft around the basket to finish over contests. And he has a decent pull-up jump shot. He was 41% in effective field goal percentage jump pull-up jumpers again obviously you want to be closer to 50 but for a young player that skill typically devotes uh you know develops later on in their skill development so nice little pickup there in Kobe Bufkin they also got Mohamed Goye a uh in the early second round just a big athletic forward for athleticism off the bench they also signed Wesley Matthews a short kind of stocky two guard I covered him very closely when he was with the Lakers a couple years ago very very good defensive player but has some offensive limitations an inconsistent shooter and has a hard time beating people off the bounce. But, you know, when it comes to having a guy who can guard on the perimeter off the bench, he brings a certain amount of value. They also got Patty Mills. He did not play much last year and didn't shoot particularly well. And then he didn't shoot very well with the Australian national team this summer either. So I don't know how much he's going to play, but this is a team that desperately needs shooting. So, like, you're going to see one of the theme the, – every team – preview that we do, there's like a theme, a, a general weakness, something they need to address. And by far the biggest weakness in this Atlanta Hawks team is their spacing. They struggle to create space for their stars to create. And when you factor in the fact that they were seventh in offense last year, you know, that just goes to show you what they could be capable of if they got the necessary spacing. And Patty Mills could in theory help with that. I just wonder if he's too old to be able to help at this point. Uh, look at their depth chart. At the guard position, Trey Young, DeJounte Murray, Bogdan Bogdanovich, Kobe Bufkin, Patty Mills, Wesley Matthews, and Garrison Matthews. At the forwards, DeAndre Hunter, one of my favorite young forwards in the league, that classic big stocky forward. Um, Sadiq Bey, A.J. Griffin, and Jalen Johnson. And then their bigs right now, Clint Capella, Anyeka Okongwu, Bruno Fernando, and Mohamed Goye. Their starting lineup is going to be an interesting thing to see this year. Um, obviously they're going to start Trey Young, DeJounte Murray, DeAndre Hunter, and Clint Capella, but who's going to start in John Collins' spot? And I think there's two potential directions they can go there. They can go with A.J. Griffin or Sadiq Bey, but most importantly, they're going to need shooting out of that position. All right, let's talk about the offensive end of the floor for a minute. This is a heavy, heavy pick-and-roll offense in Atlanta. They ran over 3,500 of them last year. Only the, only the Chicago Bulls ran more pick and roll than the Atlanta Hawks last year. That said, they were middle of the pack in efficiency. They scored just 1.001 points per possession in pick and roll, which ranked 17th 
in the NBA. Their primary pick and roll ball handler is Trey Young. By himself, he ran 1,726 pick and rolls, by far the most in the NBA. <clears throat> Luka Doncic was second on that list with 1,375, so literally almost 400 fewer than Trey Young ran. So he's by far the highest volume pick and roll player in the league. Trey was not particularly efficient, 1.05 points per possession. Among the 15 players in the league last year to run at least 1,000 pick and rolls, Trey finished ninth in efficiency. Now the main reason for that, like I said, and it's going to be the theme of this particular show, is that the Hawks are not a very good spacing team. They're not good at converting kickout passes to spot up shooters into catch and shoot threes or attacking closeouts into better opportunities. They don't convert those into into points very well. They converted spot up positions uh, possessions last year at 0.98 points per possession. That was the third worst mark in the entire NBA. They were bottom five in three-pointers made. They were bottom 10 in three-point percentage, and they weren't attacking closeouts well when they put it on the floor. Part of this was lineup construction. They were running two bigs, and neither of them can shoot. John Collins, for the record, was the worst spot-up player in the entire NBA last year. There were 68 NBA players last year to log at least 250 spot-up possessions, and John Collins finished dead last on that list. 68 out of 68 players scoring just 0.86 points per possession every time he got a chance to attack in a spot-up situation. The problem there, too, is DeJounte Murray and DeAndre Hunter were both also below point per possession. So you've got three guys, four guys, if you count Clint Capella, in the starting lineup that were all bad spot-up players. Trey Young was the only good spot-up player in the starting lineup. So from the perspective of lineup construction, you've got DeJounte Murray, who's a good pull-up shooter, but not a good spot-up shooter. You've got Trey Young, who's good at both, right? Then you've got DeAndre Hunter, who's a good spot-up player, but just not quite good enough attacking closeouts and knocking down catch-and-shoot shots to be over a point per possession. And then you've got Clint Capella, who can't shoot either. So you're in a situation where teams are really packing the pain. And when you watched the Hawks last year, you could see that. They were primarily a team that would attack in pick-and-roll or attack switches in pick-and-roll, right? Like DeJounte Murray or Trey Young ending up switched onto a big man. And what you would see is defenders digging down into the driving lanes, knowing that if they kick out to DeAndre Hunter, he had a little bit of a slower release, so he would be someone you could close out on and force him to put the ball on the floor. Same thing goes for DeJounte Murray. You get the the drill here. And then John Collins is the worst spot at player in the league, right? So it just really started to cause problems for them in their spacing. And it, it's a miracle that they were seventh in offense in spite of all of that. But I think a lineup change is going to go a long way. By getting John Collins out of the picture, you're going to bring in a wing into that position, someone who's comfortable playing from the perimeter. And both Sadiq Bay and A.J. Griffin were well over a point per possession in spot-up situations last year. So both of them are going to be comfortable catching and shooting and catching and ripping from the perimeter off of kickout passes in pick and roll, something that they didn't get enough of out of the starting lineup last year. That should allow them to run more traditional four out one in spacing and allow their ball handlers to have better opportunities to score in pick and roll. Now, DeJounte Murray and DeAndre Hunter also need to improve. That's part of the process there. Hopefully they identified that. Their analytics department hopefully identified that. Hopefully Quinn Snyder has identified that, and they will emphasize that throughout this season. <clears throat> Quick look at their other shot creators. DeJounte Murray, uh, remember that 1,000 pick-and-roll list? So the 15 players who ran at least 1,000 pick-and-rolls. DeJounte Murray finished 14th out of 15 on that list. The only player in the NBA, high-volume pick-and-roll, who was worse than DeJounte Murray last year was Jalen Green. So he just in general needs to be a lot better. DeJounte Murray was also well below a point per possession in ISO situations, 312 points on 330 ISOs. On tape, once again, the biggest uh, issue identified was spacing. It's DeJounte Murray in those high hesitations, looking to attack. And this is a guy who's a freak athlete who has the ability to get to the basket and guys are just digging down into driving lanes. And DeJounte Murray's having to take these tough pull-up jump shots over the top of the defense because he's not getting to the rim in that clogged paint situation. Now, here's the thing. DeJounte Murray actually shot 45% on pull-up jump shots last year, but they're all long twos. He's not a guy who takes pull-up threes and makes them consistently. So that means, we talked about this a lot when we were talking about unguardability. Like, 45% sounds good on paper. Like, oh, he's making almost half of his pull-up jump shots. But when they're all twos, 
that's only nine tenths of a point per possession. That's something that did, that the defense is going to live with, and something that's going to hurt your efficiency on a per possession basis in the long run over the course of the season. And so again, getting more traditional spacing should make things easier on everybody, not just Trey Young, but also DeJounte Murray as well. And then DeJounte just has to learn how to play off the ball. He shot just 50% in effective field goal percentage on catch and shoot jumpers. That's not good. 47% when he was unguarded. So like literally he's under a point per possession on catch and shoot jump shots when they're leaving him wide open. That's something that he's got to rectify. If he's going to play on a system like this, that a heavy pick and roll system where his teammate is the guy who's running more pick and rolls than anybody in the entire NBA, he's got to be able to catch and shoot or at the very least do what Dwayne Wade did in the early 2010s and learn how to drive closeouts and work as a cutter. He's got to find some way to be a better threat off the basketball. Football is back in full swing with another week of epic games. And who's got you covered on the action for every single one of them? DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. New customers can bet $5 on football and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Nobody's missing out on the action this season. All DraftKings customers can take advantage of two new offers every single game day this September. Get in on the NFL Week 2 action with DraftKings Sportsbook. Download the app now and use code HOOPS to sign up. New customers can bet just $5 and take home $200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope and why to 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. See dkng.co slash football for eligibility, terms, and responsible gambling resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. DeAndre Hunter, a very impressive shot creation for a 25-year-old as a third option. A career-high 15.4 points per game on 56% true shooting. And he was at a point per possession in self-creation situations. 171 points on 171 pick and rolls. 64 points on 65 isos. 48 points on 48 post-ups. Almost perfect symmetry there, right? So anytime you can toss the ball to your third option and he's good for a point per possession creating against a static half-court defense, that's excellent. And so that's an exciting element to the development process of this Atlanta Hawks team is DeAndre Hunter continues to get better. And by far the most impressive part of the uh, DeAndre Hunter process of his development is his pull-up jump shot. It's actually crazy. I'll give you guys a, a wild stat here. There were three players in the NBA last year who attempted at least 200 pull-up jump shots and made more than half of them. Take a guess at who those players are. The first two are obvious. Kevin Durant and Kawhi Leonard. The two most efficient mid-range pull-up jump shooters in the league. DeAndre Hunter is the third guy. He shot 54% in effective field goal percentage on pull-up jump shots overall. Made more than half of them. And that's a huge part of what makes him successful in his self-creation situations. And like on tape... There's not a lot of redundancy there. Like a lot of pull-up jump shooters, it's like they're only comfortable out of a left-handed hesitation pull-up, right? DeAndre Hunter's got it all. He's got a little a hard step back in his left hand. He's got a step back in his right hand. He can hit him out of hesitations in his right hand and is in his left hand. You can tell he's got, you know, either a very good skills coach or he's worked really really hard with the player development team at uh, with the Atlanta Hawks and he has done a great job building out a reliable pull-up jump shot from the mid-range. Again, he just has to improve as a spot-up player. By the way, remember that 68-player list of guys who ran at least 250 spot-up possessions? DeAndre Hunter finished 53rd out of 68, which is not good enough. So obviously, he's got to get better. As a matter of fact, in that 68-player list, you've got DeAndre Hunter at 53, DeJounte, uh, DeJounte Murray at 60, and then John Collins at 68. So you can kind of see where the spacing issues came from. Their starting lineup just was full of a bunch of guys who didn't know how to play off the basketball. So that's the biggest area of improvement right now for DeJounte Murray. A few things I'd like to see from the Hawks offensively from a process standpoint this year. I'd like to see them run in transition more. 
This is a super athletic team. Clint Capella is one of the best bigs in the league at running the floor. DeAndre Hunter is an outstanding athlete. DeJounte Murray is an outstanding athlete. Sadiq Bey or A.J. Griffin, whoever they put in there, is an outstanding athlete. Trey Young is a great passer who can throw kickaheads. They need to run. Last year, they were 19th in transition frequency. That's leaving points on the table. That's being too methodical and attacking a set defense too frequently. So I'd like to see them run more. And then I'd like to see them add more complications to their pick-and-roll attack. The, the Atlanta Hawks were one of the most boring teams to watch last year, in large part because they were very stagnant in their offensive approach. And you'd see it. I mean, and it extended into the Celtics series. It'd be like, here's Trey Young, like, screen, rescreen, screen, rescreen, try to get something open. And the other three guys are just standing around. That makes you easy to guard. So the question is, what are complications in pick and roll? Now, for the record, I know Quinn Snyder's on top of this. He is a much smarter basketball mind than me. I know that he's picked up on this in his time being around the team. And my guess is he's going to, with a full training camp now, being with the team for a full season from start to finish, I am convinced that he's going to add these things. But I want to talk about what they are and how they can help for a couple of minutes. So to me... A complication to your pick-and-roll attack is an action that you run either before or during the pick-and-roll to make it harder to guard. So let's give you some examples. A before example would be like a pistol action. A pistol action is a dribble handoff that flows into the ball screen. Imagine the primary ball handler that you want running the ball screen starting in the corner. Imagine a horn set, okay, where you've got your two bigs at the elbows and your primary your point guard's up at the top of the key. He's going to go down and run a dribble handoff with the man in the corner. Then the man in the corner, as Trey Young is going, uh, that, that big man at the elbow is going to turn and set a ball screen as DeJounte Murray is grabbing the dribble handoff and coming off of that ball screen. Why is that important? Because Trey Young's defen- defender and DeJounte Murray's defender now have to either switch or fight through a screen before the pick and roll. Which makes it harder because obviously in a static pick and roll situation, let's say I'm guarding Trey Young, he's dribbling on the left wing, and here comes Clint Capella to set a screen. I see it coming. I'm guarding Trey. I can prepare to sidle up over the screen, get over the top of it, and apply that back pressure, right? But if I have Trey Young and I'm running down and he runs a quick dribble handoff and suddenly I'm guarding DeJounte Murray and DeJounte Murray's in full speed and I'm not in position, I can get caught on that ball screen more frequently, right? That's an example. Pistol's an example of that type of complication. Another one I put down is ram action. Ram action is when you have your ball screen or start under the basket and you have an off-ball guard set a pin down on the screen defender so that your ball screener can come up with separation from the big man. Because in a lot of cases, especially against pull-up shooters like Trey Young and DeJounte Murray, you want your screen defender up there at the level of the screen. Why? So that if he gets over the top of the screen, you can contest the pull-up jump shot, right? But if the big man is getting hit by an off-ball screen, they're not going to want to switch it because it's a guard on a big, right? And you want your screen defender to guard pick and roll. So if you can land a screen on that guy, now your ball screener is going up to set the screen and the screen defender is trailing the play because he got screened. And now that either buys an opportunity for that pull-up jump shot, or now as the screen defender, I have to close out, which might open opportunities for the split to snake the pick and roll or to hit the pocket pass, right? So those are just two examples of an action that flows into a pick and roll that make it harder for the for the uh, on-ball defenders in the case of pistol action or harder for the screen defenders in the case of ram action. But those are two examples. During the action, what kind of complications can you have during an action to make pick and roll harder to guard? Uh, One is just having weak side action. So say, for instance, you're running pick and roll on the left side of the floor. On the right side of the floor, you just run a pin down for a shooter. Why is that important? Because now those two help defenders are occupied guarding that action. If they're just standing, if one's standing in the corner and the other's standing on the wing, their defenders can have a foot in the paint and be watching your pick and roll. But if they're interchanging, now they're at the very least having to pay some attention to what's happening behind them, which will occupy them and make it more likely for you to be able to get into the paint. And then the second one is one we've talked about a lot on the show, which is Spain pick and roll. Having a shooter underneath the basket that relocates to the top of the key 
as the big man is rolling to the rim. They also can screen for each other in that action, either the roll man screening for the shooter or the shooter back screening on the roll man. But no matter what, generally speaking, just the roll gravity of the big man as he's rolling towards the basket generally will occupy the shooter's defender and you typically get an opportunity for a catch and shoot wide open shot at the top of the key or at least a, an opportunity to attack a close out there. But those are just examples of things that you can do to not be so stagnant, to not be so predictable. And for the record, this is not earth shattering stuff here. I'm not discovering how to fix the Atlanta Hawks offense. This is stuff I guarantee you Quinn Snyder has already noticed and I guarantee you him and his staff are putting together as we speak, a bunch of things to try to make things easier for this offense because this is a team that has too much firepower to only be seventh in offense, especially with all of the different things that are holding them back at this point. <clears throat> the last thing I think they should add is a little bit more variety in their attack. Too much pick and roll, in my opinion. Find other ways to generate offense. You've got guys that can attack switches. Both DeAndre Hunter and Sadiq Bey were well over a point per possession in post-up situations last year. So, run a 1-3 pick and roll instead of a 1-5 pick and roll. That's almost certainly going to end in a switch. Then instead of just having, because like right now they're running the one five pick and roll or two five pick and roll, and it's always an ISO in the switch situation. And when they switch, it's Dejounte Murray and Trey Young taking pull up jump shots over the top most of the time because everyone's digging down off the ball, right? But if you run a 1-3 pick and roll or a 1-4 pick and roll with Sadiq Bey or with DeAndre Hunter, you get a switch, you dump it down to the block, and you're getting something different looking, just something different. Then the same two guys running the same ISOs or the same two guys running the same pick and rolls. And these are guys that are good at it. Not to mention that sort of thing pays dividends when you get to the postseason, especially when you have the opportunity to attack matchups in those partic uh, particular situations. But more than anything else, I just think they should do that to become less predictable. Let's talk about the defensive end for a little bit. The Hawks were a bad defense last year. They were 22nd in defensive rating, 22nd in half-court defense, according to Cleaning the Glass. They were the fourth worst paint defense in the league. They gave up 53 paint points per 100 possessions, which ranked 27th in the NBA. They gave up 20.4 restricted area makes per game. That was the third most in the NBA. Most of it comes down to two things, in my opinion. Dribble penetration, so the guards... Like, and DeJounte Murray used to be an all-defense level player, and he hasn't made an all-defense team since 2018, and he's become more of an offensive-minded player. Trey Young's one of the worst defenders in the league. Obviously, that's going to lead to a lot of dribble penetration. And then the other big thing that's killing them right now is roll man possession. So they gave up 458 made baskets to the roll man in pick and roll last year, which was the fourth most in the entire NBA. What does that tell us? To me... This, the roll man getting lots of touches also can be attributed to point of attack defense. What causes the roll man to be open? If the screen defender is engaged by the ball handler, right? So if the screen defender, Clint Capella in this case, has to show high or has to come away from the paint to contain a ball handler more frequently, that is what opens up the pocket pass and the lob pass, right? Right? So that's one of those things where it's the roll man getting the basket, but it's not necessarily the screen defender's fault. That's a point of attack thing. If you stay attached more at the top of the key, or at least get over the top of the screen and funnel better, then your big can drop further back. And if he drops further back, now he can contain the roll man while protect protecting the rim against the ball handlers. So point of attack defense is the main point of weakness in the Hawks defense, in my opinion. <laughs> They also were not a very good rebounding team. They were 18th in defensive rebounding. They gave up 246 putbacks last year, which was the ninth most in the NBA. They were also bottom half of the league in both transition defense frequency and transition, transition defense efficiency. Really, the only thing the Hawks did well was guard the three-point line. They were top 10 in opponent makes, opponent's uh, attempts per 100 possessions, and in opponent three-point percentage. So that's the one thing they do well defensively is guard the three-point three, uh, three line. But when you do everything else poorly, it's going to be really, really hard to be a very good defense. Um, let's talk personnel for a second, though, because they have a solid rim protector. They have legit wing athleticism. So to me, it's Trey Young and DeJounte Murray. Those two guys have to lead the way. DeJounte has to recommit to the defensive end, and Trey Young just has to do a job. Quinn Snyder is going to craft a job for him. Hey, dude, this is all I need you to do. Just do it. Like, 
You don't have to keep your man in front. It doesn't matter if guys shoot over the top, but you have to, at the very least, be able to provide something for me within this defense. And whatever that is, he's got to be bought in. That will help them everywhere else. Again, if, they, if their point of attack defense improves, Clint Capella will be able to stay at the rim more. If Clint Capella can stay at the rim more, you can guard pick and roll two on two more. If you're guarding two on two more in pick and roll, you're going to give up fewer baskets to the roll man, right? And then in general, it's going to help you a lot in rebounding. Because if you can guard actions two on two instead of three on two, you're going to be in rotation less. If you're in rotation less, then you're going to be matched up for box outs. A lot of times when you're in rotation is when you give up offensive rebounds because guys aren't matched up. They're running and flying around. Everything comes down to point of attack defense. As I've said a lot on this show over the years, point of attack defense is becoming one of the most important elements of NBA defense because of how spread out things are. And when your point of attack defense is weak, everything else suffers. And look, Clint Capella is not Anthony Davis, but he's a good rim protector. You can have a good paint defense. You're capable of that. You just have to improve at the point of attack. So in summary, this will never be a great defensive team with Trey Young in the lineup, but they can be closer to 15 if they work on those specific things that I mentioned. On offense, they were seventh last year despite horrific spot-up play. Getting rid of John Collins should help that, and then just in general, their main starters improving as off-ball players. Last year, the Hawks were 41-41. and 41. My prediction is that they end up with closer to 45 wins this year. I do think the Hawks are going to be better this year than they were last year, and I think they're going to be in that group kind of fighting to get out of the play-in. So in that like five, six, seven, eight range, and again, they're all going to be this close. The, the league is so deep this year. You're not going to see big spread out standings, in my opinion. I think everyone's going to be really crunched up on each other, and I don't think it's going to be one of those things where you can easily predict seeding. I, I think they're going to be around 45 wins, and I think they're going to be right around the upper edge of the play-in tournament, if not out of the play-in. All right, let's talk mailbag questions. I've got three of them for you guys today. The first one is from Jordan. If you could play big minutes on an NBA team for this next year, which one would it be and why? So we're going to have some fun with this one. First of all, I would never be able to play in the NBA. I'm a very good basketball player, but I'm not an NBA player. If you put me into an NBA training camp tomorrow, I would get eaten alive by those guys. Again, I've worked really hard to become a good basketball player, but there's levels to this shit. I'm good enough to go play overseas. I'm not good enough to play in the NBA. And even when I say go, good enough to play overseas, I'm not one of those guys who'd be over there making millions. If I would have stayed over there and, and played, I, I probably could have made a living and, and played. Maybe if I got lucky, I could have made it to one of the top leagues, but I never would have been one of the guys that was like a fringe NBA player that's over there making millions. There's levels to this shit. I'm not an NBA player. That said, if I absolutely had to play for one NBA team this year and I had to pick one that I'd have the best chance to earn minutes, it'd be the Golden State Warriors. And the main reason why is because they're small. I am 6'6", and I have uh, a 6'11 wingspan. I jump really well, and I always was a really good rebounder. I finished top three in my conference in rebounds twice. I actually had a 20, reba uh, 20 rebound game when I was in college, a bunch of like, you know, you know, 18.16 rebound games, like 24.14 rebound games. Like I was a very good rebounder when I was in college. And so that combined with the fact that the Warriors make basketball easy for people and the fact that Steph's going to get chased by multiple guys and I'm going to have like wide open opportunities to attack closeouts and take catch and shoot threes, like that would be my best opportunity because I could help them on the glass and maybe – make some plays on offense but to be clear if you put me in the Warriors training camp here in a couple weeks those guys would eat me alive that's just the reality of NBA basketball but it's a fun thing to have fun and think about here uh second mailbag question from Prince Samurai you said shortening the season to 66 games would help with urgency and participation what would we do for individual NBA records wouldn't LeBron's scoring record Steph's three-point record and others like it be forever out of reach for new players. Honestly, I just don't care. I mean, what about expansion? There were guys who made all-star teams and all-NBA selections when there were many fewer teams in the league, right? Like, does that diminish the, 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 the credit that should go to a championship team? Like, what about, what if we start accepting the fact that during Michael Jordan's titles, the league was smaller? And then they expanded and had a bunch of expansion teams, right? Like there's a bunch of conversations we could have as the game has changed. So the reality is, is the game has changed. Like 
Ray Allen played in a league where three-point shooting wasn't as emphasized. That's not to take away Steph. Steph is the greatest shooter of all time. And I think he would have been a better shooter than Ray Allen even if they played in the same era. But the point is, is like the game changes. And shortening the regular season would just be another way for the game to change. Even if we stay at 82 games forever, it's possible that LeBron's scoring record gets broke because, I don't know, maybe maybe they had a four-point line. Maybe pace gets even crazier. Maybe skill level goes up another level. And maybe NBA games start finishing around 150 points a team. And maybe dudes are averaging 40, and in 15 years, some guy passes LeBron. Like, that's just the reality of the changing game. So, like, I understand it's a good question, um, but I my counter to that would be who cares? Like, you know, obviously in a perfect world, if we could keep static circumstances and track everything equally, but that's just not how it works. Like, LeBron's scoring record, he didn't go to college. You know, a lot of the dudes that he passed on that list went to college. That's not fair either, right? So if you're, in, if you're just in general in life, and this goes well beyond basketball, if you're hoping for fair, you're going to be disappointed because it's, it's just not going to end up that way. Um, last question from Felipe. What do you make of Anthony Davis saying he wants to play the four? This is something that I saw the other day, and I think my friend Jovan Buha said that um, – that AD will probably start at the five, but then just spend some of his shifts at the four. Here's where I get concerned with Anthony Davis at the four. It's a simple question of defensive responsibilities, right? Like you're going to have your primary point of attack defender who's going to guard their on-ball guard. You're going to have your lock and trail defender that's going to guard their two guard, who's probably going to be running off of off-ball action more frequently, right? More dribble handoffs, more off-screen action. Then you're going to have a pick-and-roll screen defender, right? That's your big man, typically your five. Then you're going to have a low man. It's going to be the guy that you put on their worst shooter that they're typically going to tuck away in the weak side corner, and your man's that man, the low man, is going to be primarily helping at the paint, at the rim, out of that position. In between those four spots, though, is the three. And the three in the modern NBA is more like another two-guard if not a smaller, more perimeter-oriented small forward, right? And so in that situation, that guy's going to have to navigate a lot of screen actions and chase around on the perimeter a lot. And so if you have a situation where you want to play LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and a center at the same time, presumably you're asking the center to be your pick-and-roll defender, Anthony Davis to be the roll man or the low man, now I'm asking LeBron to chase around on the perimeter at his 21st season or Anthony Davis to chase around the perimeter so LeBron can stay as the low man or LeBron's off the floor. Is that Rui Hachimura? Is he now chasing threes around? You, you get the point. Like It's one of those things where fundamentally as a team, like whoever plays the three has to be willing to chase around on the perimeter. Everything makes more sense if you slot Anthony Davis at the five. Because if Anthony Davis is at the five, it's going to be LeBron James and Rui Hachimura playing the four. Those two are going to split those minutes, right? They're going to primarily be low man. Anthony Davis is going to have Jackson Hayes or Christian Wood come off the bench for him, right? If he, if they come off the bench, they become your pick and roll defender. Your threes, the guy who chased threes around, that's going to be your Jared Vanderbilt. That's going to be your, um, um, I'm blanking on his name, the guy they picked up from the Minnesota Timberwolves, uh, Torian Prince, right? And, uh, and then as you go to the two guards and one guards, that's where you got your lock and trail defenders and your point of attack defenders. But everything slots better in terms of defensive responsibilities of ADs at the five. Now, if you are going to play AD at the four, you have to play him next to Christian Wood. Why? Because AD can't shoot anymore. Christian Wood is a very good three-point shooter. And so at the very least, you can run a four-out one in concept with Christian Wood on the floor at the five. But in that situation, if you're going to run AD at the, five, at the four, the way it would have to look is LeBron would have to be on the bench. So this would have to be when LeBron subs out of the game halfway through the, end of the, or halfway through the first quarter. You're going to have to bring in a, uh, a, a three, a legit three, either Jared Vanderbilt or, and I, Jared Vanderbilt's like a four offensively, but he's like a three defensively. But you need to put Jared Vanderbilt in there 
and you or or Torian Prince, and then Anthony Davis becomes your low man. Christian Wood's going to have to be your pick and roll defender, and Christian Wood's not a very good pick and roll defender. So even in that case, you're probably going to have to have Anthony Davis behave defensively as a five, and that defeats the purpose. So like again, I understand it why AD wants to because more size on the floor means you know less physical uh, ask for Anthony Davis. But at the end of the day, like everything slots better with this Laker roster with AD at the five because they have an amazing forward core. Between LeBron James, Rui Hachimura, Jared Vanderbilt, and, uh, and uh, Torian Prince, they've got really good forwards. And the only way you're going to find minutes for all those guys is if AD plays most of his minutes at the five. Again, think of it this way. If you're ranking the top four Lakers, it's LeBron James, Anthony Davis, Rui Hachimura and Austin Reeves, right? Austin Reeves is probably the third best. LeBron's probably the second best, 81. And Rui Hachimura is probably your fourth best player. So in this case, two of your top four players are power forwards or play that traditional big forward look, right? Instead of that skinny forward who chases around on the perimeter. So just in terms of slotting, if you think of a 10-man rotation, which the Lakers will probably use in the regular season or maybe a nine-man rotation, but maybe a 10-man rotation in the regular season... You need two centers, two big forwards, two small forwards, two you know off-ball guards, and two on-ball guards, right? And so as soon as you move AD into the four, LeBron's playing 34 minutes a night. Is AD going to play 14 minutes at the four? Okay, now where does Rui Hachimura play? You can kind of see how that gets more complicated. So like, even though it's what AD wants, it's very obviously not what's best for the team. And so I don't know how they're going to rectify that. Um, but Darvin Ham's going to have to deal with it, apparently, if his, if his star wants to play that way. All right, guys, that is all I have for today. As always, I sincerely appreciate your support. I hope you guys have an incredible weekend, and we will be back on Monday with number 16.